This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me this morning to John chapter number 6. I'll give you just a moment to turn there, but I would like to bring a message to you this morning that is related to the fact that we're going to be observing the Lord's Supper and Communion this morning. You say, Preacher, I have been participating in the Lord's Supper and Communion my entire Christian life. and I've been around it before that, even before I got saved, and there's probably nothing new that you could say that I haven't already heard. Well, that might be the case, I'm not sure, but I believe that the message God has given me is specifically for this morning, and I hope that maybe some of it you will remember, and maybe it'll just bring it back to your uh, remembrance. But I hope also there might be a few new things that you've not heard before that will uh, hopefully just be a blessing to you that much more if it's new. If you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word. As I read our text this morning that is found in the Gospel of John, chapter number 6, verses 30 through 36, here's what the Bible says. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What doest, uh, what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then, Je then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. This is, of course, Jesus responding to those that are listening to his teaching and preaching, some that had seen the miracles that he had performed, and they are asking him about, well, they're wanting a sign. They're wanting a, a sign to prove that he really is the Messiah, the one that he claimed to be, the Son of God. Jesus says to them that he is the bread of life. They were familiar with the stories from their childhood growing up about the stories of ancient times in Israel's history of the manna, that bread that God put on the ground every morning for 40 years as their ancestors wandered through the wilderness. And God gave them that bread every day, well, six days a week anyway. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, the bread that you need is he that is sent from the Father. Jesus, of course, would go on to shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. But it's his body that was given on the tree. His blood that was shed for you and for me. That is what saves our soul. Communion, or the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of what He did for us. It's something, though, that even among those who are Christians and many others who believe they are Christians but are not, have misunderstood the Lord's Supper. What's going on? What does it symbolize? Why do we do it the way we do it in a Baptist church that's different than other denominations. Why do we do it the way we do it? What does it represent? What does the Bible teach? 
I'd like to bring you a message this morning entitled, What You Do Reveals What You Believe. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that for the next few minutes, our minds and our hearts might be focused upon you, your word, Lord, and the observance of the Lord's Supper. Father, that we might know and understand as Christians exactly what it is that we're doing and why we do it, and that it might have more meaning to us both this morning and for the rest of our lives. I pray, too, that if there be any person here that's not sure of their salvation, that this morning would be the morning that they would stop running, stop fighting, stop resisting, and allow your Holy Spirit to get control of their heart and their life, that they would receive you as their Savior this morning. For it's in Jesus' name and for His sake we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What you do reveals what you believe. During the Middle Ages and even before and after that, there were a group of people who were called the alchemists. The alchemists practiced what was called alchemy. That is, they believed that they could change different types of material items into other types of material items. Of course, the most well-known of their uh, tricks of the trade, they claimed that they could take some base metal such as lead, iron, copper, and turn it somehow, transform it into gold or some other precious metal. The alchemist. They literally taught that they could change one thing into something else. Now, I say that as my uh, introduction illustration this morning because there are some denominations of Christianity that uh, claim that when you partake of the Lord's Supper, communion, as we're going to do in just a few minutes this morning, that the actual elements of communion themselves, the bread and the fruit of the vine, as you partake of them, they literally become the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ. Not figuratively, not symbolically, but literally as you consume them, they become the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church are the most well-known of these uh, groups who believe that. As you already know, your pastor doesn't even consider the Roman Catholic Church a Christian church for a number of reasons we don't have time to talk about right now. But one of the things that they are extremely different about in their practice than you and I are is that belief that the, the elements of communion literally turn into the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, I want to do something before we look at some other passages of Scripture this morning. First of all, is there a young person here this morning that would volunteer to help me with an illustration? You don't have to say anything. Timothy. All right, Timothy, if you'll come on up. First of all, I want to thank you for your willingness to volunteer. If you'll just stand right there for a minute. I want to kind of illustrate for you what goes on in the Catholic Church when they observe communion. And Timothy's going to help me this morning. First of all, in the Catholic Church, as I already indicated, they believe that the we're going to pretend this is uh, wine in the cup here, not, not the preacher's ice water. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't have one, but we're going to pretend this is the round wafer that the, the priest has. Um, we're going to seek to demonstrate to the rest of them, Timothy, what goes on when someone goes to the Catholic Mass to receive what they call the Holy Eucharist which they believe is, is Jesus being re-sacrificed. So, I want to kind of portray it so you see what happens. We'll talk a little bit about it, then we'll see what the Scriptures have to say. First of all, before the priest in the Catholic Church gives the wafer or the, uh, the fruit of the vine to whoever is about to partake of the Holy Eucharist, as they call it, um, there are several things that you ought to know. 
In the service where this takes place, there will be uh, something sitting either directly behind the priest or somewhere off to the side that will look similar to a candelabra, uh, uh, something where you would put a candle, but it will be a, a golden stand with a golden sunburst in a circle uh, on the top of that instead of a place to put a candle. And in the center of that sunburst, they will either uh, place one of their round wafers they use for uh, communion, mass, or they'll have, uh, have it there that is uh, a, a duplicate of one or something to replicate one. Maybe it's of gold or maybe it's a, an actual wafer. But that will be off to the side. Now, for those of you that have been through our Bible study on Mystery Babylon, you should already have bells and whistles going off in your mind. That sunburst and something inside the sunburst being, uh, being revered or worshipped is something that goes all the way back further than the Catholic Church that was created in the 4th century. It goes back to ancient pagan Egypt and the worship of the sun god and Amun-Ra and his son Osiris who uh, was born of the sun, the sun god reincarnated. Of course, it's a, uh, it's a false teaching, a, um, a false version of the true story of Jesus coming from God the Father. But that's what that's the picture, to portray. And the sunburst imagery that you see in the Catholic Church is not something that started in the 4th century with the Catholic Church. It goes back to pagan Egypt and their worship, worship of Amun-Ra, the sun god, Osiris, Isis, Horus, Seth, and all the others. But when the priest is ready to present the wafer and the wine, which is fermented wine. It's the alcoholic kind of wine. It's not grape juice. Before he does that, he will offer a prayer asking God to turn these elements into the literal flesh of Christ and the literal blood of Christ when each person partakes. You'll have to wait your turn sitting there in the congregation this morning. Only Timothy's going to get an opportunity this morning. And I'm not going to make you drink after me, Timothy. But the person would come forward. The priest would be standing here with all of his priestly garb of the Catholic Church. And the parishioner would come forward and would kneel in front of the priest. Now, I want you to pay close attention to what happens because there's meaning and symbolism behind what we do as Baptists. But there's also symbolism and meaning behind everything that goes on in the Catholic portrayal of this that's different. First of all, the, the person kneeling. They're kneeling in front of a priest, signifying that the priest, as a member of the clergy, is somehow a little higher in authority than the parishioner is, the common person is. So you're looking up at the priest. You're dependent upon the priest. In the Baptist church, you know how we do it. There's a, uh, there's a plate that's passed and you take the element for yourself. No one comes by and puts it in your mouth or hands you the cup. But in the Catholic church, the parishioner is dependent upon coming to the priest. Don't forget that. We'll come back to it in a moment. So the person comes to the priest. The priest then, personally with his own hand, puts the wafer in the person's mouth or puts it on some type of a spoon or something like that and puts it in the person's mouth. In most cases, most Catholic services, the actual congregant never touches the element for that would defile the element since the priest prayed over it. So the priest himself is the only one allowed to touch it and puts it into the mouth of the congregant. And that person consumes it and believes that it literally turns into the flesh of Jesus as they're eating it. 
I don't have one, and we're not going to ask Timothy to put this in his mouth, but that's what happens. Then the priest, usually using a, 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 a goblet made of, of gold, something to that effect, a chalice made out of gold, would have real wine, supposedly portraying the blood of Christ, and it is again the priest that touches it and holds it and allows the person to take a sip. Again, believing that when that congregant swallows it, it literally turns in to the actual blood of Christ. Not symbolic, but literally Jesus' blood as they consume it. Timothy, I want to thank you this morning for your help. That wasn't hard. You didn't even have any lines. No, not going to do any sprinkling today. But I want you to listen for just a few minutes as I I try to remind us of of the symbolism there and, and, and what is being portrayed and why they do it the way they do it in the Catholic Church. Now, I want to say at the outset, if you have Catholic friends or Catholic family members, don't, don't be upset or offended with a preacher. I just want you to know for yourself what's going on so that you understand what's wrong about it, what the Bible says about it, so that you're not confused and hopefully you can be a help to someone else. There are a lot of things going on in that little bitty portrayal that you just saw. First of all, the thing that should immediately stand out to all of us that's different than the way it's done in a Baptist church and a lot of other churches is that the congregant comes forward and kneels before a man, the Catholic priest. The clergy and the Catholic church are viewed as being higher spiritually than the average person. That priest is the one who physically puts the wafer in the person's mouth. Physically holds the chalice, the goblet, for the person to drink from. Symbolic of the fact that in the Roman Catholic belief system, a person has to go through a priest to get to God. Much the same way that later in the week, He's going to come back to the Catholic Church and he's going to sit in this little thing that looks like an old telephone booth over there and he's going to sit on one side of a screen while the priest sits hidden on the other side and he's going to confess his sins to God by confessing them to a priest. Again, all symbolic of the fact that in the Catholic belief system, your salvation is dependent upon you going through Another man. The priest. And yet we know Scripture says the opposite of that. The book of Colossians says there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is only one person that you have to go through to get to God, and that's Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. The perfect God-man. You don't have to go through this preacher. You don't have to go through a deacon. You don't have to go through the ushers. You don't have to go through any other person to get to God. You can go directly to Him yourself. That is both when you're getting saved and after you're saved. In fact, the New Testament tells us we can come boldly, therefore, before the throne of Christ. Why? Because we have direct access to God. You know, in the Old Testament, the Jews had a sacrificial system and they too had to go through priests to have their sacrifices offered. They would go to the temple in Jerusalem. The priest would offer the sacrifices for the sins of the people. And then once a year, the high priest would go into that room, that that building that was really a tent with two rooms in it. He would go into the front room that was the holy place, but then once a year he would go into that second room that was behind that called the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place, 
which is where the Ark of the Covenant sat, with the two cherubim looking down in judgment at the lid of the Ark called the Mercy Seat, where they could see the broken law of God that was held inside the Ark of the Covenant. The priest would go in there once a year to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. But there was a veil between the two rooms. It was a thick, heavy curtain of sorts. You can read the book of Exodus and it tells us of what materials the veil was made. But the high priest went in there one time a year. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that when Jesus offered His own self as the sacrifice for sins, it was the fulfillment of all those animal sacrifices that had been picturing, portraying, were shadows of the real sacrifice that was to come. And the Bible says He went into the heaven, heavenly temple. He offered His own blood on the heavenly mercy seat And he offered himself, his blood, as the sacrifice for sins once for all. And then sat down at the right hand of the Father, where he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. You know who my mediator is? You know who my intercessor is? It's not some fellow wearing a pointed hat. It's Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. So the symbolism in the Catholics' portrayal of Mass when they partake of the what they call the Holy Eucharist portrays what they want to portray of individuals like you having to come and kneel before a man and be dependent upon a man who's just as sinful, just as mortal as you. That's why they... Take it from the hand of another man. From a priest who is their mediator. The same one they're going to go to to confess their sins later in the week. He's their intercessor, their mediator. You don't need one of those. You don't need, you don't need this preacher to be your mediator. Now if you want the preacher to pray for you... I'm more than happy to pray for you. I'm more than happy to pray with you. I've done that with several folks just in the last week. But you don't need this pastor in order to be able to go directly to God. You can do that yourself. I hope you do it every day. Praying, talking to the Lord. Having your own personal relationship with God. Why do Roman Catholics seem like it's a cold, dead religion? It's because it is a cold, dead religion. You and I have a faith in Christ and a personal relationship with Him. That's the way it's supposed to be. Not through a man. Not through a priest. And then we have to talk about the two elements that are used in mass. The wafer, unleavened bread, similar to what we're going to use. Then there's the fruit of the vine. The difference, of course, in the Catholic Church and in some other churches is that they use what we usually think of as wine, the alcoholic kind of wine, fermented wine. But in Scripture, repeatedly when Jesus is talking to either the disciples or the Pharisees and Sadducees, He talks about the leavening of the Pharisees. That is the sin of in their lives. And Jesus throughout the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, repeatedly refers to leavening as a symbol of sin in people's lives. That's why the bread that we use in our communion, of course, is unleavened bread. But it's also why when we partake of the fruit of the vine, we use what the Bible calls new wine, not old wine, not fermented wine. Because the the fermentation in the wine is the same as the leavening in the bread. It's symbolic, the fermentation is symbolic of the 
the sin. And as Jesus said, a little leaven, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It only takes a little sin to ruin the whole thing. By the way, doesn't matter if you're uh, what the world thinks of as good or bad, we're all sinners. So that unleavened bread and that grape juice that's not fermented, they accurately portray the body and the blood of Jesus. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God which came to, came to taketh away the sins of the world because Jesus had no sin. That's why He was able to be our sacrifice. His body was sinless. His life was sinless. His blood was not tainted with the poison of sin. But the Catholics, they're portraying something different when they use fermented wine and not unfermented wine. Then they partake of it. Why the belief, by the way, that belief that it literally turns into the body, the flesh, and the blood of Jesus, that's called transubstantiation. Substance, substantiation, trans, the prefix. Trans, the prefix means through or across. In other words, just like the alchemists of medieval times believed they could turn lead into gold, they believe that when they say that prayer over the elements and then put it in the person's mouth, it magically transforms from bread to flesh, from wine to blood. They believe it literally transforms, transubstantiation. What they're saying when they give that to the congregant, when each Roman Catholic goes and kneels in front of that priest, they are taught and they believe that every time they partake of it, they are re-sacrificing Jesus for their sins. They believe that's what's happening every Friday or Saturday night when they go to take Mass or every Sunday morning. They believe that they are re-sacrificing Jesus again. But wait a minute, what does the Bible say? The Bible says He offered sacrifice for sins once for all and sat down at the right hand of the Father where He ever liveth to make intercession for us. You want to know why the Roman Catholics, all of their crosses have Jesus still hanging on the cross? It's because in the Catholic religion... Jesus has to be sacrificed over and over and over again. And every time you partake of that, they believe you're re-sacrificing Jesus again for your sins. By the way, this is not something that just started with the Catholic Church in the 4th century. In fact, even though the Catholics were teaching this doctrine somewhat uh, throughout the centuries, it wasn't until the 12th century, the 1100s, I'm sorry, the 13th century, it was around 1211 or 1213, that they officially declared that transubstantiation is, is the truth, what the Catholic Church believes. So all those other hundreds of years, going back to the 4th century, they didn't teach that, they didn't preach that. Some people in the Catholic Church believed it. The rest did not. So even the Catholics have only been believing that for a while. But they didn't come up with it. They didn't start it. Preacher, where did that belief in, in the wafer and the wine literally turning into the flesh of Jesus, where did that idea come from? That too goes back to Mystery Babylon. One of the pagan practices of many of the ancient pagan religions that all came from the Tower of Babel, such as the worship of Osiris in Egypt, or the worship of Baal and Ashtaroth by the Canaanites who lived around the children of Israel. Remember Jeremiah told the children of Israel... Uh, he got on to them because they were doing the same thing as the Canaanites who lived with them and they were offering cakes to the queen of heaven. 
Guess who the Catholics refer to as the Queen of Heaven? Mary. The Virgin. Mary. I submit to you the the Queen of Heaven that the Roman Catholic Church is worshiping is not Mary in the Bible. For the mother of Jesus never wished to be worshipped and was never commanded to be worshipped. She is a sinner just like you and I, and she too had to have a Savior just like you and I. But those cakes that were made, that are referred to by Jeremiah as cakes offered to the Queen of Heaven, they're similar to the little wafers that were made in Egypt by the priests in Egypt in the worship of Ra, the sun god, and his manifestation in the flesh in the form of his son Osiris. The Egyptian priests taught the adherence of the ancient pagan religion in Egypt that when they partook from this wafer that the priests of Egypt put into the mouth of their believers, it literally, as they consumed it, turned into the actual flesh of their god Osiris. That's from ancient times. It's going back to Mystery Babylon, the false religion that spread from the Tower of Babel as people scattered throughout the world. It's way before Jesus ever died on the cross. It's a pagan rite, ritual, that's been going on for hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus ever died on the cross. So the Catholic belief in transubstantiation, it's not a Christian belief. It's nothing that is taught in Scripture as you'll see in just a moment. It's a pagan belief that they are eating their God, and that somehow by eating their God, He is becoming part of them. That's why when Roman Catholics sometimes use the same terminology that you and I do, people think they're Christians just like Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians are Christians. They are not. Like many cults, And false religions, they'll use some of the same terminology that you and I are familiar with. Why? Because it makes them appear to be Christian, but what they believe is not Christian. They may call what they do communion or the Lord's Supper. It is not. It is not what was practiced in the New Testament. It is what was practiced in the worship of Osiris in ancient Egypt. It is a pagan Practice, not a biblical practice. This Catholic ritual is not Christian. It's not biblical. By the way, the the Lutherans, who are Protestants, they're called Protestants because they protested the Catholic Church and came out of the Catholic Church, They're just like all the other Protestant denominations. They got some things right when they came out of the Catholic Church, but they brought some things with them out of the Catholic Church that are still wrong. For example, uh, their their, uh, priesthood of sorts and their belief in what takes place at the Lord's Supper. The Lutherans aren't as far off as the Catholics but they practice something they call consubstantiation. Substance, substantiation. The prefix here is con, C-O-N, and that means with. Con, like connection, connectivity. With something. Consubstantiation, believed by the Lutherans, they believe that when you partake of the, the bread and the fruit of the vine, that Jesus mysteriously is is present with you when you partake of it. The Spirit of God is present with a Christian when he partakes, but the person of Jesus is not present and won't be present here today. Because where is Jesus right now? He is seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever liveth for the saints. 
He is there interceding up in heaven right now. He's not coming back today when we partake of the Lord's Supper. The Spirit of God is here, but not the second person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus won't be here. So the Catholics are wrong. And in that regard, so too are the Lutherans. So, so what does the Bible say about the Lord's Supper? And why do we as Baptists do it the way that we do it here in our church? You ought to know. You ought to be able to explain to people what's the difference and why do, why do you crazy Baptists do it so different than the rest of the world does? If you still have your place open to John chapter 6, turn back just a few pages to Luke 22. It's just probably three or four pages back in your Bible. Luke chapter 22, and I want to read one of the passages where Jesus is having what's called the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper with those disciples on the night before He was arrested. Luke chapter 22, I'm going to read verses 17 through 20. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. What we see here in this passage, this recording of the Lord's Supper, is that Jesus plainly said, This do in remembrance of me. This makes it crystal clear, this is a... This is to be a symbol. It's to be symbolic. This do, why? To get you to heaven? No, it doesn't save you, like the Catholics teach. doesn't help save you, like the Catholics teach. Why do we do it then? We do it in remembrance. And we do it because Jesus commanded us to do it. This do in remembrance. It's symbolic. The bread is symbolic of His body, the new wine, the grape juice, is symbolic of the precious blood of Christ, which is without sin, without error. There's no leavening in the bread and no fermentation in the fruit of the vine, because Jesus was without sin. Of what is it to remind us? I'm glad you asked the question. The Apostle Paul tells us, what it is we're supposed to remember. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. So other than just remembering Jesus, are there some specific things we're supposed to remember this morning when we observe the Lord's Supper? Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, listen to what the Apostle Paul said. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. In other words, Paul's saying, what I'm about to tell you is what Jesus told me to tell you. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Paul just told us there in verse 26, there are two things this is supposed to bring to remembrance. So in just a few minutes, when the ushers come forward and they, uh, they take the bread and the fruit of the vine and they disseminate it throughout the rest of us, and you and I partake of it, number one, it's symbolic. 
it is not going to literally turn back into the flesh of Jesus or his blood. Number two, uh, when they give it to us and we partake, it is to remind us of two things. Number one, of his death, of his sacrifice. You and I should never take lightly, should never take for granted that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for us. We should never forget it. That it took that sacrifice for you and I to be saved. It's no little thing that he died for us. And then secondly of all, it ought to bring back to our remembrance that Paul said, quoting Jesus, this do in remembrance of me, showing his death till he come. He's coming back one day. We're supposed to do this as a reminder not only of his death, but that he's coming back one day. Because when he comes back one day, we're not going to be down here doing this anymore. But it's to remind us he's coming back. Adults, young people alike, Jesus might come back today. With everything we see going on in the world around us, I would say it's more likely than not that he's coming back today. You say, preacher, are you saying he's coming back today? No, I didn't say that. But it is as likely today, I would say more likely than it was yesterday. And even more likely than it was 2,000 years ago. But we do it because it's symbolic as a reminder. It is to remind us of his death on the cross and of the fact that he's coming back one day. One last thing I'll say about the Catholic portrayal of communion before I finish this morning is this. Why is it that the Catholic Church teaches you have to come back and re-sacrifice Jesus every week at Mass? Why do they teach that Jesus is literally being sacrificed every time somebody partakes? His own flesh and His own blood. It's because they believe you can lose your salvation. They believe your salvation is based upon your works, both to get saved and to stay saved. That if you do all the seven sacraments of the church, you're looking good. But that if you break the sacraments, or you don't do everything you're supposed to do, while you're in trouble and you're going to have to spend a whole lot of extra time in that waiting room they call purgatory. That's not biblical either. But the reason they re-sacrifice or believe that you have to re-sacrifice Jesus every week is to pay for your sins that you've committed since the last time you came and had the Holy Eucharist. In other words, they think that when you get, quote unquote, what we would call saved, your sins are paid for up to that point, but any sins you commit this week afterwards, you got to go see the priest to get those taken away. Because if you die without getting these taken away over the last week, you're still in trouble. So each week they have to come re-sacrifice Jesus to pay for the sins they committed since the last time they partook of the quote-unquote, Holy Eucharist. It's because they have the unbiblical belief that salvation is by works and that you can lose your salvation. And yet the Apostle Paul couldn't have said it more clearly. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We are not saved by our works and we cannot lose our salvation whether our works are good or bad after we get saved. Whether you ought to have good works or not I think goes without saying. But you don't have to get saved again and you don't have to re-sacrifice Jesus again and when they offer that Jesus is not being put back on the cross He's not being re-sacrificed. His work is done. When Jesus said, it is finished, 
He meant it is finished. And the sacrifice, the penalty, was paid. As I close, I want to read three verses from Paul's passage there in 1 Corinthians 11 that I already read from a moment ago. Beginning in verse 27, Paul said, Now, when you get ready to take the Lord's Supper, he said, Do this. So listen carefully, folks, because we're about to partake. He said, verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. And then Paul says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In other words, some of you have already died because you didn't take seriously your participation in the Lord's Supper. So what does Paul mean when he says, not to partake unworthily. First of all, anyone that's not saved absolutely should not partake in the Lord's Supper. No one who is uh, unsaved should partake in the Lord's Supper. So if you're not saved yet, you'll have an opportunity in a moment to come forward and receive Jesus as your Savior. But if you don't do that, you should not partake of the Lord's Supper. Number two, what about Christians? Paul said, let a man examine himself. When we have invitation in just a moment before we observe the Lord's Supper, it's a time for you and I both to examine our lives, our hearts, and make sure everything is right before God. You and I ought not partake this morning even if we're saved, even if we're baptized. If there's something in our heart we haven't made right with God. You'll have a moment to do that. I hope you'll do that if there's anything not right. Would you bow your heads and stand to your feet quietly and reverently as Mary comes to play? We won't sing an invitational hymn this morning, but Mary's going to play in a moment. During that invitation will be my time and your time to examine ourselves. I hope you're doing that now.